Good evening and welcome once again to the Ernest F. Hollings Special Collection Library. Tonight's kind of a special night for us. Um, it's a real pleasure to celebrate Maureen's research, her scholarship, and the exceptional publication that's come from that. But the reason it's a special night is because Maureen and John are truly parts of our library family. John's been president of our Cooper Society. Uh, Maureen is on the board of the Cooper Society, and I've heard a rumor that she's going to be the president in the future. But that, that, apparently the election hasn't taken place yet, so I'm, I don't think I'm allowed to tell you that. Um, Mr. Sally's with us tonight. Where's Mr. Sally? There's Hink Sally's with us tonight. And Hink, Hink, whenever we have an event, he always calls me up. And he says, Tom, there's this event next Thursday. Do you think I should go? And I said, Hink, if you're going to go to one event this year, go to this one. Because we've got Maureen, we've got music, and it's not going to get any better than that. And we got the wonderful author here, you know. I know her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's... That's Maureen. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's okay, Hank. We're just happy that you're here. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to have a distinguished faculty member to introduce Maureen. And so I invited Professor Ellen Schlafer, who is in charge of the USC Opera, to uh, introduce Maureen. And uh, uh, I started to look at Ellen's bio. And I have to tell you, that if I described every opera that Maureen has staged in every city, we'd be here all night. So let me just summarize and say that we're very lucky at the university and we're very lucky here in Columbia to have an individual of Ellen's caliber. Please welcome to the podium, Professor Ellen Slafer. First of all, I'm pretty sure most of y'all have been uh, tapped by Tom once or twice for something, so you know he's a big liar, um, that he couldn't find anybody more distinguished than me. I am very honored to stand here today and to tell Maureen that, was it two years ago you came to my office and, we're, and the project was well underway? Um, I'm proud to know you. Um, and I am proud of this book for many reasons. You have given me a tool for my students. I'm, I'm the director of the opera program. I teach two opera workshop classes for grads and undergrads, and part of what I do is try to teach opera history. And my mission when I came to Carolina 10 years ago was to emphasize as much as possible America's place in the opera world, opera uh, as written by Americans and presented by Americans. And suddenly you've given me a tool that I didn't have for my students. I've talked to them and they were, I had several of them online to come tonight, but uh, the concert choir has a rehearsal, and when a rehearsal trumps everything, right? Um, but I've known Maureen and of her long before I came to the university, her work with the, the book Annex. Is that the name of it, the right thing? I can't. Attic. Oh, let's see, it's been a long day. Um, but uh, it has been very important to my family in, in preserving a lot of old books we had, and I just, uh, I wanted to tell you a couple things my students said in the last two weeks. First of all, nobody knew she existed. And um, I was able to, to say, open discussions, and that's the important part for me, is that my students can begin to discuss issues as related to opera, um, but not great world issues, the, the issues of race relations, the specific problems of singers as a whole, if you want to, uh, any kind, um, and how difficult it is to make a living as a, a singer period, an opera singer, and it hasn't changed. Uh, and then we launched into the discussion of how incredible it was for this woman, being an African American at the time, of, of changing thoughts in the world, to have the career she had, and how sad that she didn't have the career she was, should have had. And it also leads us to discussions about what happened to the Columbia Opera House and other opera houses around here. But your scholarship, uh, your drive, the fact that you had a dream and you followed it and have given us all this great gift. Um, I, all these people are here to tell you, but I'm, I, I especially as a teacher and an advocate of opera and an advocate of American singing opera. You've given us a great gift. So it is 
my great pleasure to introduce someone that you probably can read about in the book, in the paper, or anything else. But please join me in thanking Maureen Lee for her work, for her time, and for her gift to all of us. Well, after an introduction like that, my goodness. <laughs> thank you, Ellen, so much. Um, good afternoon, and thank you so much for coming. Before I begin, I, I want to thank Dean Tom McNally, Dean of the Libraries, for giving me the opportunity to talk about Ciceretta and tell you about her. I also want to thank Elizabeth Suddeth, and I want to thank Christine um, Nichol Morris for all the hard work and support they've given me in the last uh, few weeks to get this program together. As a member of the Thomas Cooper Society, which Tom mentioned, one of the privileges of belonging to the society is they give you um, library privileges here uh, at Carolina, Carol, Carolina Libraries, which is a very important thing. If you should, you should join the society. But that um, allowed me to tap into the wonderful resources that are available here. And I use them to a great extent. And I wanted to thank all the staff at the Thomas Cooper Library and the Carolinaiana um, for those who helped me with my research, um, who got into library loans, Bill Suddeth and his group who let me use those antiquated but now updated um, uh, microfilm readers downstairs, and I thank you so much. And I also want to thank the USC Press for publishing my book. Well, as Ellen said, few people today really know about Ciceretta Jones, yet this gifted soprano had a very long and prosperous career as an international singing star at a time when there were few such opportunities available to African Americans. Ciceretta's music was her life. From the time she was a child, she knew she wanted to sing. She once said in a newspaper interview, quote, I can never remember a time when I did not sing. I used to sing to myself as a child because I loved music, but it was after singing a solo at a Sunday school concert in Providence, Rhode Island, that someone said to my mother, the child took a high C, you should let her learn music. And that's how I came to study. Ciceretta's career consisted of two parts. From 1888 to 1896, she sang opera selections and concert ballads on the concert stage, often billed as the greatest singer of her race, which you see on this, um, well, it got cut off on the theater poster from the Library of Congress, but that's how she was billed. She thrilled both black and white audiences with her magnificent voice. She was called the Black Patty, a sobriquet that com um, suggested a comparison to the famous European opera star, white opera star, Adelina Patti. The second half of Ciceretta's career, 1896 to 1914, she was the star of an all-black musical comedy company called the Black Patti Troubadours and later the Black Patti Musical Comedy Company. This company, owned and managed by two white men, provided Ciceretta the opportunity to, con sing to continue singing operatic arias and serious musics when there were fewer lucrative concert engagements available to her. The troupe entertained in hundreds of American and Canadian opera houses and theaters, and they were particularly popular in the South and the Southwest, and they even came to South Carolina many times. By the time Ciceretta completed her 28-year career, career in 1915, she had performed for four U.S. presidents. She'd been one of the first black women to sing at Carnegie Hall. She'd sung in Europe, South America, Cuba, the West Indies, and Canada, and had performed extensively throughout the United States. She appeared in 46 of the 48 lower states. And I bet you can't guess which two she missed. Um, Vermont and South Dakota. <laughs> now, she may have been there, but I couldn't find any record of her there, and for the rest of them, I could. Ciceretta was not the only black female um, vocalist recognized for performing serious music during this time period. Others included Nellie Brown Mitchell, Marie Salika, Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield, and Flora Batson. However, Ciceretta was the most famous, and her career lasted the longest. I'm going to begin today's program talking about her concert years. I'm often asked whether she made any recordings. And although the technology was available toward the latter part of her career where she could have made recordings, she did not, or at least none have been found to this date. But although we don't have a recording, we're fortunate today to have a very special guest who may help us imagine how Ciceretta sounded when she sang. Vocalist Rose Davis from Myrtle Beach is going to sing three selections that Ciceretta performed during her career. Rose will be accompanied by pianist Al Roberts 
And following this mini concert, I'll tell you about um, her years as the star of the Black Patty Troubadours, and then at the end I'll answer some questions and I'll show those pictures again. Matilda Ciceretta Joyner was born in Portsmouth, Virginia in 1868, just three years after the Civil War. Her father, Jeremiah, who had been born into slavery, um, was a carpenter and a part-time minister at the African Methodist Church in Portsmouth. He could read and write. Her mother was illiterate, and she took in washing and ironing, and she sang at the Ebenezer, in the choir at the Ebenezer Baptist Church. Ciceretta was the oldest of three children. She had um, a younger brother and sister, but they both died very young. In late 1876, when Ciceretta was eight years old, her father got an opportunity to take the family north to Providence, Rhode Island, where he reportedly had been offered a ministerial position, and I'm sure he felt it was the right thing to do for the family to try and bring them, bring them north. The family moved to Providence, where Ciceretta attended primary and grammar school. Ciceretta's father and mother separated a few years after they arrived in the city. Well, Ciceretta sang in a lot of church programs and festivals. And one years later in a newspaper interview, she recalled one of the very first times that she sang at a church hall. She said, quote, oh, I was scared so I could hardly catch my breath. When the applause came, I almost fell off the stage. But timidity was soon replaced by confidence, and I kept on singing at charitable enterprises. Well, as she grew up, she got some early vocal training in Rhode Island, in Providence, and she continued to sing in church programs. At the age of 15, love struck, and she married David Richard Jones, a handsome biracial bellman at the fashionable Narragansett Hotel. They had one child, Mabel Adelina Jones, and unfortunately she died at the age of two. Soon after Mabel's death, Ciceretta focused more on her, or her career, and she started some vocal training in Boston and perhaps even at the Boston Conservatory of Music. She also sang concerts in Rhode Island and nearby states. She got her first big, big break in July of 1888 when she was hired as a star of an all-black troupe that was headed for South America and the West Indies. She made two successful tours there between August of 1888 and July of 1891. And sometimes the local government officials or the civic leaders would give her jewelry or a medal, often made of gold, to thank her. And she wore these medals. There were about 17 of them, and you can see some of them in the poster pinned to her gown when she performed in some of the early concert years. Ciceretta didn't really make a name for herself in the United States until about 1892. That was the year she sang for President Benjamin Harrison and his guests at a luncheon in the Blue Room at the White House. One of the selections she sang that day was Stephen Foster's Old Folks at Home, more commonly known as Swanee River. Well, this song became her signature song. Two months after her White House uh, concert, she was the star of a three-day Grand Negro Jubilee held at Madison Square Garden, April the 26th through the 28th. And this performance turn was a turning point in her career. An opening night before an audience of 5,000 people, the majority of whom were white, Ciceretta dazzled the crowd with the cavatina from Mayor Bear's Robert Le Diable, La Farfalla from Ettore Gelli, and Sempre Libra from uh, Verdi's La Traviata. She gave two encores, Swanee River and Maggie, the cows are in the clover, and she received a standing ovation from the crowd. Ciceretta's appearance that evening was so outstanding that Langston Hughes and Milton Meltzer, in their 1976 book about black entertainment, called her performance one of the 36 milestones in the history of, quote, the Negro's participation in American entertainment, end quote. Soon after this concert, Ciceretta signed a contract with a major entertainment manager she received additional vocal training, and she found more concert opportunities available to her. Well, critics sang her praises following that concert at Madison Square Garden, including one from the Detroit Plain Dealer. But he had um, something rather prophetic to say. He, he predicted that her career would be hampered because of her race. Opera, he said, would be unavailable to her, and eventually concert appearances would be limited once the novelty of an African-American singer performing serious music died out. Ciceretta was fortunate to continue her concert career for the next four and a half years. Her savvy manager, James Pond, a white man who represented people like Mark Twain and Charles Dickens, apparently knew how difficult it would be to get um, white musicians and vocalists to share the stage with Ciceretta. So he paired her with European um, Europe performers. He also booked concerts for her 
uh, where she would be seen by predominantly white audiences and written about in the mainstream press. This helped to advance her fame. For example, Pond booked several appearances for her at the town of, resort town of Saratoga Springs, New York. A review in the Saratoga Union following an outdoor concert August the 6th, 1892, described Ciceretta's voice as, quote, beautiful, clear, steady, and resonant. There is neither brass in her notes nor thickness in her phrasing. Her enunciation is also perfect. The exquisite crispness with which she executes complex, complicated scales in rapid time delighted all. With all, she sings intelligently, without affectation, and with much feeling." End quote. During her concert years, Ciceretta sang throughout the United States and Canada, performing in 1892 and 1893 for a couple of weeks each time at the Pittsburgh Exposition. She sang at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, and she sang four times at Carnegie Hall between 1892 and 1896. She also sang at an 1894 concert at Madison Square Garden that was led by the famous Czech composer Antonin Dvorak. Ciceretta remained under Pond's management for about two years. During this time, her fame spread across the United States and Canada. Their relationship was rocky at best, and it ended in mid-1894. In February of 1895, Ciceretta and her husband and a new manager, Rudolf Vogel, sailed to Germany to make her European debut. Ciceretta was in Europe for nine months. She performed for the Duke of Cambridge and the Prince of Wales while in London, and she gave concerts in Germany, France, and perhaps Italy. Little is known about her time in Europe, and it's a subject that's ripe for research, and I've had contact from a couple of folks who are actually doing some research, some graduate students. Um, we know Ciceretta had fond memories of Europe, particularly London. She once told a newspaper reporter in 1906, quote, my appearance at Covent Garden London was one of the most exalted triumphs of my career. There was a fine audience and women um, took bouquets from their corsages and threw them on the stage, end quote. In Europe, Ciceretta experienced more freedom from the racial discrimination she lived with back in the States. Recalling her European tour, she told a newspaper reporter, quote, in Europe, there is no prejudice against my race. If a man or a woman is a great actor or a great musician or a great singer, they will extend a warm welcome, no matter whether he be a Jew or Greek or Gentile. It is the artist's soul that they look at there, not the color of his skin. Ciceretta left Europe and returned to New York in 1895, November, to sing in a vaudeville show at Proctor's Pleasure Palace in New York City. She hoped to return the following year in the spring, but that was not to be. Little did she know that her brief foray into vaudeville would signify a major career change. It became easier for Ciceretta's manager to find vaudeville appearances for Ciceretta rather than concert bookings. And most of the other black women who sang serious music on the concert stage during her day, such as Marie Salika and Nellie Brown Mitchell, they also found less concert work available and they started and in turned instead to opening music studios and directing church and community choirs. These black vocalists were no longer a curiosity to white audiences, as music historian Eileen Southern explained in her 1983 book, The Music of Black Americans, A History. Southern said, quote, the fickle public soon tired of black prima donnas. Although the singers were gifted, well-trained, and fortunate in obtaining good management, their careers on the concert stage were relatively short. By the mid-1890s, the black prima donna had almost disappeared from the nation's concert halls because of lack of public interest, end quote. So I'm going to stop here now, and we're going to, um, and I'll pick up Ciceretta's career after we have our little mini concert. We're going to hear Miss Rose Davis sing three of the selections that Ciceretta often performed. She'll be accompanied by Mr. Al Roberts. Rose is going to sing Charles Goudinard's Ave Maria, piece that Ciceretta included in three of her four um, Carnegie Hall appearances and at numerous concerts after that. And Rose will also sing I Dreamt I Dwelt in Marble Halls from the Bohemian Girl. And she will close with Ciceretta's signature song, Stephen Foster's Old Folks at Home. So I'm going to turn the program over to Rose and to Al. Thank you. 
Well, thank you so much, Rose and Al. That was just so wonderful. I mean, I feel like Ciceretta is with us tonight. Um, all right, I'm going to tell you now. You have to listen to the boring part. No, it's not boring. <laughs> but after all that excitement, um, I'm going to tell you about the second half of Ciceretta's career and her retirement years. In 1860, uh, 1896, soon after she returned from Europe, Ciceretta was offered a new opportunity to star in a black road show that would have um, the, her name in the title, Black Patty Troubadours. With the need for a steady income to support herself and her husband, Ciceretta accepted the offer. The show was owned uh, and uh, run by her former uh, manager, Rudolph Vogel, and his partner, John Nolan. The three-act show, similar in its format to a minstrel show, included comedy, music, farcical skits, dance, and vaudeville, and it featured Ciceretta singing operatic and concert pieces in the third act, which was called the Operatic Kaleidoscope. With the Black Patty Troubadours, Ciceretta could look forward to steady employment, a good income, and dependable management. The Black Patty Troubadours, with its all-black cast, debuted August the 17th, 1896, in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. After a first act skit by the troupe's 40-member um, cast and a second act of vaudeville, Ciceretta made her grand entrance in the operatic kaleidoscope. She and several of the members of her troupe performed selections um, from the Bohemian Girl and Il Trovatore and other operas. And this three-part format with Ciceretta singing in the third act lasted for many years. During the third act, Ciceretta and members of her troupe would perform concert ballads and various selections from operas like Rigoletto, Orpheus in the Underworld, Lucia de Lammermoor, HMS Pinafore, and the Chimes of Normandy. Eventually, Ciceretta added more ballads and popular songs in the second act. And finally, by the end of her career, she even had a speaking part in the, in the whole play. You may have noticed, um, some of you who came in early, that Al was playing some ragtime music. Ciceretta did not sing ragtime music, but the people in her show um, sang quite a bit of it. Um, this syncopated, these syncopated tunes were very popular during the 1890s and the early 1900s, and had you come to a performance of the Black Patty Troubadours, you would have heard plenty of that kind of music in the first part of the show. Ciceretta remained the star of the Black Patty Troubadours, later called the Black Patty Musical Comedy Company, from mid-1896 until the end of 1914, almost 19 years. Her troupe became a training ground for many African Americans who were seeking a career in show business. Some of those um, who worked in her show went on to have successful careers as comedians, composers, singers, and dancers. Ciceretta and her company began touring um, their touring season in late August or early September of one year, and they'd go until uh, late May or early June of the following year. At the end of each season, she always returned to Providence to be with her mother, with whom she was very close. She uh, filed for divorce from her husband in 1898. He turned out to be a ne'er-do-well who enjoyed spending her money. And um, she filed him a, a divorce for non-support, and they were divorced the following year. Ciceretta and her troupe were on the road 42 to 45 weeks at a time. By November of 1899, managers Vogel and Nolan had arranged for the troupe to travel in a private Pullman car with their own cook, making it easier for the black to performers to navigate lodging, meals, and travel arrangements in the segregated world in which they lived. They had a very grueling schedule with few week-long bookings. Instead, they usually did one-night stands, and they would be in anywhere from five to seven cities in, in a week. Um, they would often do both a matinee and an evening performance. The company crisscrossed America and Canada by rail and even appeared in Havana, Cuba in March of 8, 1904. Ciceretta and her company performed many times in California, Oregon, Texas, the upper Midwest, and in states along the East Coast. By 1898, they became increasingly popular in the South and the Southwest. At a time when blacks and whites had to buy tickets at different places and sit in separate sections of the theater, Ciceretta was such a box office favorite that she was able to draw people from both races um, wherever she performed. Sometimes the announcement that Ciceretta and her uh, troupe were coming to town was in the, on the front page of the mainstream newspaper. For example, over in Athens, we looked at some of the Athens newspapers and it was, was there. 
African Americans were proud of Ciceretta, who wore elegant gowns and magnificent jewelry and carried herself very regally, and she was charming. Like white theater goers, they were in, theater goers, they were impressed with her extraordinary voice and talent. One of her contemporaries, Liz, li, lyricist, author, and civil rights activist James Weldon Johnson, wrote that Ciceretta, quote, had most of the qualities essential in a great singer the natural voice, the physical figure, the grand air, and the engaging personality, end quote. I've examined her touring schedule in South Carolina. Her first appearance in this state was in Charleston on April the 10th, 1899, to a large audience at the Academy of Music on King Street. The auditorium had a seating capacity of 1,200. She returned to Charleston 14 times before she retired. The following year, she added regular stops in Spartanburg and Columbia. Her first Spartanburg appearance was November the 28th, 1900, at the Spartanburg Opera House, which you'll see a picture of when we roll the pictures. She played 11 times in Spartanburg and in Greenville. She made her Columbia debut on December 19th, December 18th, 1900, at the new 1500 Columbia seat, Columbia Theater, shortly after the theater opened its doors for the first time. The theater shared the building with the new Columbia City Hall, and it was located at the corner of Main and Gervais, across the street from the front of the State House. A quote from the state newspaper on December the 15th, 1900, explained the seating arrangements and the ticket sales for this debut performance. And at the end of the article, this is what it said, quote, inasmuch as the better class of Negroes are so anxious to hear this celebrated truth, it was deemed simple justice to allow them the privilege and hence the balcony has been aside, set aside for them. The white people are no less anxious to see Black Patty, and they can get downstairs seats at balcony prices uh, for this attraction, which is said to be very fine. Well, during the first uh, few years that the troubadours performed in the Columbia Theater, the first floor seats and the box seats were, of course, reserved for white patrons in the bal balcony or the gallery for the black theater goers. However, the almighty dollar spoke by the time April the 13th, 1905 came along, and the management realized that more African Americans chose to see the show than, than whites. So what they did was to reverse the seating arrangements, and they put the um, African American patrons on the first floor, and they told the whites that they could sit on the, up in the balcony. Well, no, no whites came to that performance. Thereafter, they had to make various modifications of seating arrangements and times and shows over the years because they did have both black and white folks who did want to come and see the show. Well, Jones's last performance in South Carolina was January of 1913. During the years 1900 to 1913, she performed 13 times in Columbia, eight times in Sumter, six times in Anderson, seven times each in Florence, Darlington, and Orangeburg, four times in Chester, and once in Gaffney and all her troop came to South Carolina 90 times. Ciceretta and her troop spent 19 years on the road. In fact, her company was the longest running African-American road show in the United States in its day. Ciceretta's company reflected the evolution of black entertainment from primarily farce comedies accompanied by music and patterned after three-part minstrel shows into more of a musical comedy and variety show. Black entertainment became more professional as African-Americans who aspired to the stage had more opportunities to learn their trade and display their talent while working in well-run shows, shows like the Black Patty Troubadours. Many African-American shows began to use opening comedy sketches with stronger storylines rather than relying on a farce with a thin storyline whose main purpose was to introduce the folks in the cast and get them laughing, the, the audience laughing. Um, Additionally, a crusade by black theater critics, the emerging black middle class, and some black entertainers and composers encouraged African Americans to stop reinforcing negative stereotypes by ridiculing themselves on the stage and from using racial epithets in comedy sketches and music lyrics. This effort um, achieved some success and it helped to elevate the quality of the uh, black musicals. In all the years that Ciceretta was on the road, she rarely missed a performance due to illness. In fact, I only found two examples of when that happened. However, that changed during the summer of 1913 when she had throat surgery, and she also was needed that year to stay at home and help care for her mother. So she took the entire season off um, from August of 1913 until July of 1914, and unfortunately her manager did not take the rest of the troop out on the road either. 
This was a bad time for Ciceretta and a show to be away from the stage as more and more movie houses and cheap vaudeville um, shows were taking business away from the live road shows. The company opened its final season in September of 1914. The first two months were fairly successful. They had week-long book bookings in Harlem, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Norfolk, um, and Baltimore. Once the troupe headed south, though, um, manager Mo Vocal said business turned very disastrous. The Black Patty Troubadour Company arrived in Memphis, Tennessee, just before Christmas to perform at the Black-owned and managed church auditorium. Vocal was unable to meet the expenses and pay his bills, which prompted the theater owner to attach his, the rail car, and um, it prevented the troupe from moving on to the next uh, booking. So Vocal disbanded the troupe. Ciceretta returned home to Providence in uh, January 1915, and she went there to live with her mother and um, care for her mother and be with her mother and stepfather. She performed two more times that year on the vaudeville stage without the Black Patty Company, a week in Chicago and two weeks at the Lafayette Theater in New York City, in Harlem, excuse me. After her Chicago performance, Ciceretta said her mother was ill and she was needed at home. The famous soprano spent her final years in Providence. Once uh, she left the stage, she was out of the public eye and out of the newspaper, so we don't know too much about her life after that. We know she lived quietly in a nine-room house that she had that um, remained highly mortgaged until she, she died. She took in some boarders. She tended her rose garden, and she occasionally would sing at the, in the choir at the um, Congan Street Baptist Church. As the years passed, Ciceretta sold many of her valuables to support herself, such as her jewelry, silver, some of her medals, and three pieces of rental property that she owned in Providence. Some newspaper reports said Ciceretta worked as a cook for a wealthy family sometime during her retirement years. Ciceretta was quite poor when she died of cancer on June the 24th, 1933. A realtor who was a neighbor and a former president of the local NAACP chapter often helped to pay her bills and saw to it that she was buried um, next to her mother in the Grace Church Cemetery rather than in a pauper's grave. And unfortunately to this day, neither her mother's grave nor hers have a headstone, and there is an effort underway in Rhode Island to try and change that. My biography of Ciceretta is more a reflection of her professional career, since other than newspaper interviews, performance reviews, one letter, and some court documents, I had few insights into her personal thoughts and feelings. By studying her life, however, I came away knowing she was ambitious, determined, successful, poised, confident, and passionate about her music. I learned from comments uh, made by her contemporaries that she was soft-spoken, charming, caring, and regal. Ciceretta's record of achievement was remarkable given the racially segregated world in which she lived and the limited opportunities available to African Americans, particularly black women. Ciceretta generated race pride and became a beacon for many African Americans. She was highly successful, well-paid, and greatly admired for her work by both black and white audiences. Her thrilling voice, singing operatic arias rather than minstrel songs, gave white audiences a new appreciation for the talent and the potential of African Americans, vocalists. Had Ciceretta had more vocal training, and had she been allowed a career in a professional opera company, she might be remembered like we remember uh, Marian Anderson today. Despite the limitations she faced, Ciceretta seized the opportunities available to her and pursued a lengthy, lucrative, and successful musical career. Her efforts helped pave the way for other African-American opera divas who would follow. Matilda Ciceretta Joyner Jones truly was a pioneer in the field of black entertainment. I'll be happy to take a few questions, and while I do that, I'm going to put those pictures back on that I showed you um, when you came in. One of the ones that you'll see toward the end is a lithograph, a 1903 poster-sized lithograph, and I think it speaks volumes about the importance of Ciceretta. She is the only woman on the poster, and she's pictured, it's called Onward, and she's pictured with Abraham Lincoln, Booker T. Washington, um, Frederick Douglass, W.B. Du Bois, and I think um, you'll enjoy seeing it. So let me do that, and then we'll see if we have any questions. Technology. Yes. Okay, any questions? What, what, what caused you to take on Ciceretta? I saw Ciceretta, I saw that poster of her, and 
she just spoke to me. I mean, she I, she chose me, and, and rather than me choosing her, her, her eyes, her face, her story. Um, I just felt that she didn't get the recognition she was due, and I wanted to. That was my goal, the whole thing about doing it. So, anybody else? Um, how old was she when she stopped performing? Um, let me think. I think she was about 47, 48 she when she was 68. Yeah. Yes. I think it was. Um, you know, I, it, it's hard to know what the main reason was. However, there was a newspaper quote by her husband, and her husband said something to the effect, well, don't let her fool you. The reason she wanted to come home was her mother. Um, she, she missed home. And she was extremely close to her mother, and, and I think that's probably why. Now, she may have wanted to come home and then go back, but that, that opportunity didn't present itself. Anybody else? Maureen, Rose, Al, bravo. Wonderful program. Uh, we have uh, refreshments for you in the lobby, but more importantly, Maureen will sign your books in the lobby. And for those of you who are sitting there saying to yourselves, darn, I don't have a book. Yes, we do have books for sale for you. And then you can have them signed. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Maureen. Uh, please enjoy the reception. <laughs>